you hit a rogue wave. Now, you couldn't tell the story. This was before the book, The Wave, came out and scientific evidence of these rogue waves really became. So it was still a myth back in 2001. But we hit that rogue wave and we only had one container on deck and it broke loose. And as chief mate at the time, my biggest concern was the crew wanted to run and secure this container because it was bouncing around like a biller ball on deck. But us sailors were, were our skin soft, we're marshmallows and the heavy metal, you know, can tear into a crew. So why is this important? Well, it's the hottest topic of 2001 is one. Two is, as we've talked about, this week is the week of the seafarers. And unless we address safety issues at sea, you know, we're not being respectful for those seafarers and lost containers is a major seafarer issue, human rights issue. It's also an environmental issue um, as ESG becomes more and more important. We cannot lose containers anymore unless we've done the absolute most at every level to prevent those containers lost at sea because many of them contain plastics and hazardous chemicals. And the statistics are shocking. Uh, the World Shipping Council said 1,382 containers were lost in 2019. That's reported losses. Doesn't include non-reported. And a similar number the previous two years. But here in 2021, we've already lost over 1,000 reported containers at sea. And it's because climate is, is becoming more erratic. Things are changing. And we have the technology to solve this problem. But we have to spend the time, invest the knowledge and the time in the right solutions. So I'm very excited to get this webinar up. We have just under 200 participants, and it's rapidly growing here, uh, signed on to this webinar. So like I said, the most requested uh, uh, event of 2021 in all of G Captain. Uh, and I would like to introduce you to our panelists right now. Um, first is uh, Yako of DTN. Uh, DTN uh, is, well, let me read, tell you a little bit about DTN. Around the world, organizations with complex supply chains rely on DTN to help them prosper. They deliver operational intelligence that drives confident decision-making and provides a competitive advantage. Their shipping and marine customers leverage solutions in their daily operations management, long and short-term operational planning and weather risk mitigation activities, weather risks. They ensure that they have the industry leading forecast data, analytics, and technology needed to feed fuel and protect the world. We're happy to have you, Yarko. Can you give a brief introduction? Tell everyone a little bit about yourself. Yep. Yeah, that's good. I'm Yarko van der Brink, um, uh, working at DTN uh, for, uh, for almost 15 years. Uh, I have a background in physics and meteorology, so I'm coming in from a meteorological angle, uh, and I'm the product manager uh, for shipping at DTN. Excellent. Thank you so much. We also have on the panel uh, ABB, which is a leading global technology company, which everyone here is probably familiar with because uh, they do amazing uh, things at sea. Uh, this company energizes the transformation of society and industry to achieve a more productive and sustainable future by connecting software to its electrification, robotics, automation, and motion portfolio. ABB pushes the boundaries of technology to perform, to drive performance at new levels. They have a history of excellence stretching back over 130 years and have over 100,000 talented employees in 100 com countries, uh, including Yap Yan. Uh, can you introduce yourself? Yeah, hi, uh, good afternoon. Thanks, John. Uh, my name is Jaap van Stoker. Um, I work for uh, ABB and I'm located in the Netherlands um, and I work as solution manager with uh, the Octopus product uh, to serve the clients for their digital solutions. 
Excellent. So we have a weather and physics major and a, a technology uh, expert here. And this is important because the vast majority of the container loss, the overwhelming majority are weather and vessel motion related. Uh, just in the last few years, 2014, the 8,000 TEU MOL Comfort broke apart in heavy seas because of improper weights and loading and the vessel motions when hitting a storm. In 2015, the 1200 TEU El Faro was lost with all crew aboard. Um, the Express Pearl, 2,756 TEU. Now, people don't think this is a weather because they see the pictures of the calm ocean uh, when the Express Pearl this year caught fire. But we know that the chemicals leaked out of the containers. We're not sure yet, but it, those chemicals could have leaked, started leaking during an adverse weather condition. And of course, the ever given we didn't lose containers there, but it was a very close call. And the preliminary reports are looking like it was weather and vessel motion that got that, that made it more difficult to navigate in the Suez Canal this year. So before we start, I have a little bit of uh, sea keeping, housekeeping. Uh, first note, this webinar is being recorded and the recording will be emailed to you after the webinar. We hope you view it and share it uh, we will try to answer as many questions as we can at the end. To ask a question, I think everyone's familiar with Zoom right now, but please use the Q&A feature. And you can start entering questions now. We will review it. If you are experiencing any technical difficulties, please send your questions through the Q&A feature, and we will try to help you. So what are we going to go over? First, the introduction, we told you a little bit about why this is important, and I hope I put it in context as a ship captain, how important it is to me uh, to, that, the, that the cargo is secure and that we don't have incidents at sea, and the weather is the most difficult thing, right, as a ship captain we have to face. And the weather is getting more erratic as we enter 2021, so we need these technical solutions to help us manage it. We're going to go over why the containers are lost at sea. We already talked about vessel motion and weather are by far the overwhelming cause, but we're going to dig deeper into that. How can we avoid container loss at sea? And then we're going to give you a uh, SPAS demo to show you the exact tools that you can use to reroute your reroute your vessel and handle vessel motions. Don't think this is just a weather, weather routing webinar. It goes much, much deeper than that, tying in these vessel feature uh, motions. This is what's new, this is what's exciting. This is what we need to share with our colleagues. Uh, then a conclusion and a QA. and a All right. Thank you, John, for the introduction. Uh, let's get uh, let's get started, right? And let's. Excellent. Uh, I'm excited to hear what you have. <laughs> so let me uh, first start with why sea keeping is relevant. Um, I would say the image on the on the left is already self-explanatory, right? If containers are lost at sea, the impact can be huge, especially because the incidents are of high media interests nowadays. Um, you can have damages to the assets and goods, and in the worst case, even loss of lives, right? If somebody's falling overboard or gets stuck between cargo, like in your, uh, your, your story, uh, John. And of course, environmental uh, damages that results in liability claim, cleaning costs, and in turn will also cost reputational damage to the company, uh, impacting the revenue and profits. Um, but what many people don't know is that avoiding excessive, uh, excessive motions can also lead to fuel savings. So avoiding that bumpy ride on the motion uh, on the oceans will also increase the uh, performance of the vessel and, and save on fuel and emissions. Um, yeah, like stated on the previous slide, right? The mission of DTN and ABB is to have no more cargo uh, lost at sea. Uh, so what are the facts? Um, so the graph on the left is showing the increase of vessel size over time. So on the horizontal axis, you can see uh, the years starting in 1960 all the way up to now. And on the vertical axis, uh, you see the amount of TEU, uh, the, the cargo capacity of vessels. And uh, 
you can see with the, the, the blue and black line that in the last half of a century, uh, the vessels have kind of exponentially grown. Uh, next to that, there are red dots, and those are kind of the noticeable uh, cargo incidents. Uh, again, uh, on the horizontal, horizontal axis, we have the, the years, and on the vertical axis, we have the amount of uh, containers lost. And you can clearly see that there is a correlation between the increasing vessel size and the numbers of containers lost. And well, that isn't weird, uh, I would say, but it, it's it's, it indicates that uh, if incidents are happening nowadays, uh, it can have big impacts. Eh? A big amount of containers are lost uh, when those big size, uh, big size vessels have, uh, have issues. On the right-hand side, uh, I've listed the reported container incidents of the last winter season. Uh, and you see that only last winter season, eh, in, in 2020, 2021, more than 3,000 containers were lost, and the vast majority were from MPX uh, vessels, eh, which are the last, larger new Panamax size vessels. Um, so what are the reasons then of, of losing those containers? Well, there are several reasons, and often it's a combination of factors. Uh, so I've listed the most common ones here on this sheet, and Actually, you can even group those uh, into several categories. Uh, so higher wind loading, bigger and stiffer ships, more powerful propulsions, they all contribute towards increasing forces on the lashing of the containers. But that all happens in the kind of vessel design phase. Um, next in line is, for example, the planning and loading. So poor packaging of containers, overweighted containers, or containers with structural flaws are all in the planning and, and loading phase. And then we have a, a category uh, basically with in the vessel execution phase. Uh, high linear responses due to the weather, uh, wave impacts on deck, uh, green water that hits uh, or slams against those uh, containers. Uh, the vessel that hits the seabed, which, which causes, of course, uh, and can cause to, to the lashing to crack. Uh, but also the parametric rolling of a vessel, uh, which if it's not identified quickly, can lead to excessive motions. Uh, well, in this webinar, we will predominantly uh, focus on that last part, hey, on the voyage execution part. Um, so yeah, let's go uh, over to Jaap Jan. Yes, uh, thank you, Jaco. As we take the, uh, the last slide where uh, the causes were uh, for the vessel execution um, and the vessel status and the cargo status, um, if we map them, let's say, in, in a risk review, um, we can look at stowage failure, that uh, the, the cargo is not as expected or not designed as expected uh, to cope with uh, high accelerations, um, or there are extreme motions of the vessel higher than uh, expected and higher than designed. So <clears throat> if we uh, put them uh, on the in the columns. Um, you can have uh, damage when you have uh, limited vessel motions. Um, in that case, uh, the main reason is for stowage failure, um, and of course, with high motions, the risk is even higher that you will lose cargo. Um, if the cargo is okay. Um, we can go to the to the two below lines, the vessel failure, um, or if the vessel and the cargo is designed uh, and all is okay. In that case, if, for example, there is a, an engine breakdown or a rudder failure, um, in limited vessel motions, there won't be a cargo loss if uh, the cargo is stowed uh, and secured as, as required. Um, the same is, of course, if the vessel is completely okay and, and running as uh, expected. Um, but still then, the vessel can come in higher motions than uh, designed, and this can be uh, due to uh, uh, unexpected weather conditions or improper planning, um, but also extreme events like parametric rolling. So if we check on uh, what can be done on this, um, this is of course, it becomes a bit twofold. Um, one side is really on the land side 
uh, to prevent storage failures. Uh, that has to do with container certification. Um, the weighing of container, I think, is one of the biggest issues to tackle for uh, navigation safety. Uh, container weight is, is a bit like, like uh, people in the, in the supermarket, one apple more before you uh, uh, will pay the bill. Um, so containers are often higher uh, uh, loaded than, uh, than, than recorded. So weighing the container is an important item, but it's really a, a, a landside solution which needs to be implemented globally. Um, the other thing is uh, the lashing equipment check. This is of course an ongoing effort uh, for improvement uh, from uh, uh, classification societies, from operators, from manufacturers. Um, but here is what the crew does not have a big impact on it in day-to-day -day, uh, operation with the, regarding navigation of the vessel. Um, the item where they do have, uh, of course, uh, responsibility and uh, possibilities to, to improve is in the vessel operation. And this uh, especially accounts uh, to prevent high vessel motions by routing, but also uh, one very important item, uh, which is really difficult, of course, is to detect if your uh, cargo is stowed as designed. So if you find out during a voyage that the cargo is not intact or that, uh, for example, uh, containers are damaged, um, this would have, should have an effect on, on the rest of the voyage by taking into account this in, into your routing that you uh, prevent high vessel motions. So if we can split them, um, we have the actions for the shore side with the container certification, uh, container weight check, um, and we will focus uh, mainly on the, on the vessel side. How can you operate the, the vessel uh, within the limits of the cargo? Um, can it be checked for the container strength uh, assessment? Uh, I, we really realize this is, this is a tough one, especially with the big container vessels where more than 10,000 containers are, are on the deck, but it has an effect on it. Um, and avoidance of unscheduled uh, uh, engine stops uh, and a safety assessment before drifting. So, Overall, uh, all the time when uh, cargo is lost, uh, you can blame, let's say, the vessel motions. If the vessel is rolling and pitching, um, and to be sure for, for the understanding, we like to split the vessel motions. Um, one is the normal ship motions, how a vessel is uh, rolling on, on a swell, uh, and you have the nonlinear or what's also called resonance. And there you have, for example, parametric roll. Um, if we focus on the normal ship motions, um, this is how a vessel reacts uh, also according to crew expectations. If the weights become a little bit higher, you can expect a little bit more roll. Um, uh, the vessel normally stays within lim limits, uh, of course, uh, in, in normal conditions uh, and in very high waves, of course, you will have very high responses, but this is better to plan and to assess. Um, and one very important thing, those responses can be forecasted. We will go later into that one. Then the other thing is the uh, nonlinear uh, responses. Those are really unexpected often and extreme motions. Uh, and the main cause is uh, the parametric rolling or synchronous roll. Um, and this can also occur from moderate weather conditions. Um, and what, what happens of course, is that uh, the vessel suddenly gets extreme motions because the encounter period of the waves is exactly matching uh, the parameters of the vessel regarding roll motion and pitch motion. And because it's so close, uh, if it happens, yes or no, 
it's very hard to precisely forecast it. Realistically, you cannot forecast the event, let's say one hour ahead or not, not yeah, well, 24 hours ahead is, is uh, fully impossible. But where we focus on and what we'd like to explain is that the risk can be forecasted and measured. So for normal ship motions, you can really forecast them. And for extreme events like parametric rolling, it is to take into account the risk you are taking during the operation of your vessel. So if we go uh, in a very simplified way of uh, response forecast, this is what we do at ABB and where we work together with, with DTN, is um, we have an input when the vessel is, uh, is planning a voyage, um, there is a wave forecast from, the, from DTN, from the weather forecast provider and a planned route. And we combine that together with the vessel stability with our hydrodynamic model. And this enables us to transfer the planned route into a motion forecast, to forecast per planned waypoint, what will be the pitch, what will be the roll motion, or what will, will be the sideways uh, the acceleration. And this we can advise to the crew. Then for the nonlinear responses, we have a risk forecast. And this works uh, in twofold, where we have, uh, again, the wave forecast. Uh, the wave period is very important. There we calculate what is the encounter frequency of the wave. So when the wave is hitting, how often is the wave hitting the vessel? Uh, we have the planned route, again, the, uh, the actual navigation and the stability. And here we calculate what is the risk for resonance. So what is the risk for parametric rolling? And this is then shown to the crew in, uh, in a polar plot. It's the, it's, the, it's the round graph where an area is displayed of where the, the vessel regarding speed and heading uh, is in a risk of encountering parametric roll. Um, I like to stretch that the parametric roll is really a freak event. And so therefore it's very hard to uh, assess for a crew. Let's say an extreme event with high parametric roll emotions uh, happens maybe one, per, uh, one time per thousand operational years. So that seems not a lot, but of course, if you, have, uh, uh, if you are a big container operator with 500 vessels in action, then on average, there is once per two years, there is an extreme event. So this is by really managing the risk, uh, what, what we try to, to help out with. Uh, the third one is on the, on the left corner bottom, is uh, identifying the risk by roll and pitch monitoring, where a sensor is, is recording what is the, the, the roll angle, but also the roll period, and what is the, the pitch angle and pitch period, where we combine the phase, of the two motions and display them to, to the crew where uh, the risk is assessed if the vessel is really in sync regarding the pitching and rolling. So here it can be then said that even for a small roll motion when there is not a big event happening yet, um, how big is the risk? Because the, the feeling of the vessel is, uh, is recorded and this is displayed to the crew. So to combine it, then we put it all in, uh, in, in one window regarding the forecast. That means um, if there is a limit for uh, roll motion, we, in this example, we took a very tight limit to, to uh, make a good example. Um, <clears throat> imagine uh, a vessel has uh, damaged containers on deck and it needs to go as smooth as possible to the shore side. So it has a limit of three degrees of roll. I fully realize it's, it's very low, but it's to get a nice red area. Um, so that means that in this uh, polar diagram, 
the, the red area indicates where uh, the, the, the captain and the vessel is not uh, possible to navigate regarding speed and heading. The, then uh, we also include the risk for parametric roll. This is the, 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 uh, the square area where there is the risk. So it doesn't mean it will happen, but there is a risk. And with the green, we show to the crew what are safe headings and speeds to be able to navigate the vessel safely to shore. Well, this is an example of what is a, a real-time advice to the crew. Um, together with DTM, we have the solution where it is all implemented. Um, and therefore, there are a lot of possibilities which are automated on, on the background. So what we like to show here is how the different items can pop up for the different uh, conditions. So imagine uh, a storage failure is detected by the crew. That means they have to set a tighter limit to their operation to prevent the cargo loss. So that means in moderate weather, they already have some uh, limits regarding their, uh, their navigation. That's in the top left window. Um, in harsh weather, of course, with uh, higher waves, uh, there is uh, less possibility because they need to stay within the limits of the cargo to prevent the cargo loss. If we go to the top uh, or the bottom left one, there the vessel is and the cargo is in, uh, in good condition, which means the cargo is well secured, so it can handle the designed uh, accelerations and motions. So it has uh, almost any uh, possibility of speed and heading is possible. And in heavy weather, higher waves, there are some restricted areas, as you can see on the right bottom side, and there is a restriction for the risk for parametric rolling. So these are different types of advice. Um, with SPOS, we have uh, combined this uh, in the seakeeping uh, functionality, where this is all calculated in the background. Uh, and Jarko will now demonstrate how this works out in, in a route planning. Thank you, Javian. Yeah, so let's uh, let's give a, a short demo of uh, of SPOS. So this is actually the the SPOS application um, that that's uh, that's on board. You have a weather tab uh, where you can visualize the weather uh, to get that situational awareness on what's happening over your route regarding weather. So you can put on your pressure, your wind barbs, uh, your waves, but also fronts or ice uh, ice uh, concentration information. And actually, you can loop through it uh, and cycle through it to get that situational awareness and, and know where the hazards are. Uh, not only weather parameters, but also the motion parameters are present. Um, so also the roll motion is, uh, for example, uh, present pitch motion. You can put it on and actually see where those hazardous areas are. Um, it's dependent on heading, eh? also what Jap Jan explained. Uh, so you can also change the heading and, and see eh, where the areas are with your particular heading that uh, can cause issues. Um, so, yeah, a lot of, uh, of input parameters. Um, let's basically calculate a route and let's first look at the uh, restrictions. So this is uh, the restriction window, the input window. We now have no restrictions being set, only a minimum distance uh, to avoid hurricanes. Um, and let's calculate a route uh, from Rotterdam to, to Houston as an example with some default cost parameters, some default speeds with no restrictions. And let's see what the outcome is. You can see that uh, the top line, the dark line, is basically the shortest distance. It's the Great Circle route. Uh, the weather optimized route, it's a fuel optimized route, is uh, the bottom one. So it's going south. It's uh, a case from wintertime, northern Atlantic. Um, so the weather optimized route is, is going south to avoid heavy weather and have some fuel savings uh, there. Now let's define some uh, motion limits. So we can actually define some roll motion, 10 degrees, some pitch motion, and avoid, for example, synchronic and parametric roll risk. Um, well, that's all set. Uh, let's hit OK, and uh, let's calculate the route again. 
uh, and see what's uh, what's basically happening. Um, so we're now kind of calculating the route with the same parameters, and what you will see is actually the route will end up even more south. So having those parameters being set, and there we go, it's the black line. Um, having those uh, uh, um, parameters set uh, to avoid that excessive motion, um, uh, the, the route is taking a more conservative route in the south waters, uh, which is uh, um, um, uh, less, uh, less heavy. You can also visualize the, um, the, um, uh, the, the risks. So you can put on a grid with all the risks in the red arrows. You can see where there are excessive motions uh, that exceed the limits that we just uh, pulled in into the system. The polar plot is present as well, the same one that Jaap Jan uh, showed. Uh, and actually, you can see at every spot on the, on the track how the vessel is kind of influenced uh, by the weather. You can, uh, like, just like with the weather, you can also uh, navigate your, uh, your route uh, towards your destination harbor and actually see what's happening uh, along your route uh, with that particular heading on, that har on, on your uh, uh, voyage route. Um, yeah, so uh, like mentioned, uh, it's, it's a very brief uh, summary of, uh, of, of, of a demo of SPOS. We just sc scratched the surface, I would say. There are loads more functionality in it. Um, but it's basically to get that holistic situational awareness of, of the weather conditions and the associated hazards. Be prepared and anticipate on those hazards along the route uh, so that you know what's upcoming uh, and know the areas that you want to better stay out of. Uh, and, and take advantage of favorable winds and currents uh, uh, to stay safe. Eh? That's, that's, that's one reason uh, to save on time or save on fuel. Uh, in turn, also emissions, uh, eh? saving on emissions. So I would say that's yeah, a little bit of a, of a demo of, uh, of the capabilities of, uh, of SPOS in the context of, uh, of motion forecasting. Your, yep. All right. I think this is me. Great, great job, guys. We know it's a great job because we, we have hundreds, hundreds of uh, participants on this thing and the number just kept growing, meaning no one's bored, no one's leaving. I think this topic really resonates. As I said before, it seems like a technological problem. It seems like a basic problem, but it really gets back to human rights of seafarers preventing those incidents getting those seafarers safely home and the ship safely in port and these important ESG initiatives. I, I love how you can kill uh, two birds with one stone. We don't want to kill any birds, especially talking about ESG. But you know what I mean? Uh, the fact that we can reduce fuel emissions and prevent these incidents. Um, and this parametric rolling, you know, as a former ship captain myself, I've encountered it once and it happened very slowly. Something in the back of our minds was it was strange. You know, we didn't know what was happening. The helmsman was fighting with the helm, and we thought that he was just zigging and zagging too much. Um, but then it quickly escalated. You know, these parametric rolls they start out slow, and then they they start getting worse really fast. As you can see on the YouTube, of the Tacoma Narrows Bridge is a similar situation, but. I remember we were in restricted waters. The pilot looked at the captain and said, oh man, this isn't good. What do we do? And the captain looked at me and said, this isn't good. What do we do? And I looked at the helmsman saying, this isn't good. What do we do? And then I thought we reduced speed. So I ran over the throttle, reduced speed. But the forces on that ship during that brief incident until we could get the speed down were immense. So it's important like uh, Yapian says, we can't predict this 24 hours in advance, but we can give advance notice to when it could occur, which means it's in the voyage plan, which means in the pre-work meeting, the captains and the mates can talk about, well, what are the options? Reducing speed, changing ballast, changing heading. So this is real viral stuff here, guys. And, and I think it's shown by the participant count going up. As a summary, there is an increasing trend in the amount of container loss incidents and associated media attention, right? It hits ESG, it hits seafarers rights, but it's also this media interest is growing 
with the backlog of containers and the ever given, uh, it's growing exponentially larger. There are different root, root, cause, pos, root causes possible for container loss incidents. Shore and offshore actions are required. Is it the container loading, the weights? Is it your ballast plan? What's amazing about this situation a solution is if you are monitoring those vessel motions, that's the end all be all. It doesn't matter what the computer tells you it's supposed to do. This is telling you what it is actually doing and what it will do when it encounters future weather incidents. So, I mean, this is revolutionary. Identifying and avoiding excess motion leads to overall savings and the liability risk um, uh, mitigation. Again, we're hitting multiple uh, check boxes here. And the DTN ABB solution, SPA Seakeeping, gives additional intelligence and decision support during voyage planning and execution. Their mission is zero cargo lost at sea. You know, we ending this container, and I hope we can get a little deeper into that. We have some excellent questions that I, I want to ask you guys. So if you have a question, please go to the Q&A below and Let's uh, jump right into it if, if you guys are ready for this. Yes, Drew. Yep. All right. Thank you, guys. Uh, so the first question is, um, is the weather getting more erratic? You know, I feel 20 years ago when I first went to see ship cams took weather courses and I had a good idea of when we were going to encounter these events, but it seems harder and harder for no matter how how well trained you are for the captain to understand what's happening with the, the, the weather. And we don't have the real smart tools to take over for us. So is it, is it getting more erratic? Is it harder for even an experienced meteorologist or ship captain to predict this without the technology? Yep. I can answer that, uh, John, indeed. So uh, yeah, so basically what's happening is that the weather is becoming more erratic. And actually it's also proven, uh, DTN has done some studies around sea keeping or sea margins, uh, where we kind of uh, estimate how long a voyage will take. And if you look, for example, on a voyage uh, Atlantic crossing, um, we, we studied the last 40 year of data and it comes to a number of, of days uh, that, that you need for such a crossing. If you look at the last 10 years, uh, that, that number has increased. So if you also look at the kind of numbers and the, um, the scientific numbers uh, behind it, you see that uh, you need around about uh, up to half a day extra in, in last 10 years in compared to, to that 40 year of, of data that we have, of, of weather data that we have. Um, so those studies are being done and you see indeed an increasing uh, trend uh, there. Because uh, increasing sea margins means uh, more worse weather uh, on, on route. Yeah, and those those fat tail events, right? The the black swam, as Nassim Taleb writes in his book, in anti building anti fragile systems. These these long tail events, they they're not only becoming less predictable, but they're getting getting worse, right? The extreme right. events. Yeah. Yes, exactly. More extreme uh, and more impactful. Eh? That that's what you see, and also impacting then voyage duration. Uh, and and, and uh, uh, indeed, uh, how you need to secure uh, items on board. I love that. You know, and uh, one question we got here uh, sent in is: uh, Is the SPAS data static or dynamic? You know, a lot of, and we're going to get into some. There are a lot of questions here about uh, the captain's role and the officer's role and how they can better work together. But uh, is this data? You know, do you get this data loaded when you're in port or is it updated as conditions really change? Yeah, that's, that's a really good question, right? So the, the, the data in SPOS is actually, uh, uh, it's, it's not static, right? So it's actually updated. Hey? We send uh, files towards the vessels so that the data is being updated uh, and constantly fresh information is being received. So up to four times a day, new information is being received so that you can also kind of uh, uh, do updated route calculations uh, based on the latest weather information, because that's important. 
Excellent. And, and how does this integrate with the ship systems? ABB is collecting so much information from the various systems as, uh, on board the newer ships and retrofitting some of the older ships. Uh, Yatban, can you talk a little bit about how this and how do we assure that there's con uh, connectivity when there's a, a storm and give other options like, okay, we have this problem. Can we put additional lashings or Rebalast the vessel. Can you so? Can you talk about in in the context of the broader ship systems that ABB offers? Um, well, the uh, we we are only advisory part. So, for example, uh, what our system does, it reads from the uh, loading computer. For example, we do not deliver the loading computer uh, itself, but I do think that <clears throat> when you are in uh, in a executing a voyage, for example, and you measure the risk for parametric roll, um, I think it's well worth to, to after you have detected it, to, to take precautions, uh, maybe by, by ballasting. It can make a small difference by changing your uh, roll period or your pitch period by, by using the ballasting tanks. So that, that could be an option. But at least you, it, it starts to be aware of the situation. And then it's, of course, uh, I think it's very important that it is acknowledged and also taken into account, not only by the, by the crew, but also from the shore side, because uh, safety uh, precaution can have an impact or do have an impact on, on the schedule. So it's, it's, I think it should be part of a company-wide policy um to to able to to get this done excellent and as a ship captain i have to ask is are you going to mandate that i take this route or that route and and which could put me in a specific predicament or is this an advisory service where you give you're giving me options well here's the percent well, chance that, that that's a good one because it's always uh this is especially with cargo loss it's uh after cargo loss that the blame game starts and of course we we want to be a, ahead of this um so we advise and what actually what i see what we are doing uh together with with dtn is is you combine the available information which is there up front and show it in the best way possible and and well, let's say transfer some data uh, into uh, information and give additional insight. So uh, I do not think that you can always, an accident can maybe not always be uh, avoided, but it's still an accident, but limit the risk and limit the chance for an accident. That is of course, the, that, that is the main target. And yeah, the end providing, that additional intelligence, providing that additional intelligence and decision support for the captain, right? To have, have the captain have the best uh, tools at hand to make his, uh, his decisions. Excellent. Uh, yeah. our, our first question from the audience here, I think relates very well to this. It's Chris O'Donnell and he says, blaming the issues on climate isn't the only issue. There's pressure from carriers to speed up, take risks due to current state of the market. And sometimes captains venture into storms and rough seas where they previously wouldn't. It seems to me that this adds a layer of transparency. If I can, I think back to, you know, way back to Joseph Conrad, the famous author and ship captain, you know, uh, in the book Typhoon, he said, we know there's a storm ahead. Why don't we divert? And he says, well, if we divert all these days and we don't and nothing happens, they won't believe us that there was a storm. But if we hit the storm, they'll know that we that we we worked hard. So if we know if the shore side knows there's a storm and the captain knows it, it seems like they can make the decision together, right? Is or or am I wrong there? No, that's correct. And especially with shared reality, right? Just we can ship shore so that the shore-based personnel knows what's going on is important. Yes. And uh, and then also the, the decisions can be verified. And uh, and, and like mentioned, uh, diverting. Uh, that's exactly what Spols is doing, right? Is it doesn't mean more more fuel or more time. You can take advantage of current and winds uh, in order to uh, either uh, arrive at the same time or even with less fuel. Yeah, yeah may, maybe also to command on that one because uh, it it might be seen that uh, taking uh, more safety precautions um, takes more time, but 
I like to 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 counter that one on uh, because it's a, it's an often heard argument, of course. Uh, but uh, you have to take into account that if a vessel starts uh, a voyage uh, and it goes into the bad weather, and during the bad weather they decide to reroute, that has a far bigger bigger impact on the schedule, the fuel bill, and also the risk instead of uh, going around it. So uh, the, the, the main thing is um, reassess all the time your, your planning and take into account as much information as we can uh, and, and then make the decision. And this is a, a, a decision loop. It starts uh, before departure, but it's, uh, it's the same thing during the voyage. Excellent, really good. Our next question is from Christian Berger from Safe Seas and the University of Copenhagen. He has two questions. Are you aware of reliable estimates on the environmental impact of container loss? And number two is what prospects do you see for a regulatory solution forcing the industry to adopt new technologies? So I, I think I can answer the very first one. You know, there's these are hazardous chemicals and a lot of these they're plastics the 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 impacts undeniable but the the oceans are big so we don't have the correct assessment of the total impact you know most uh sylvia earl was our america's famous oceanographer was saying saying it's the impacts a lot larger than anyone estimates and it will become larger in the future topic but the second issue is the regulatory instances. Do you see the IMO or flag states or inner cargo, inner tanko, those types requiring the use of technology like this in the future uh, because it's 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 proven effective? Well, I think um, all the attention it gets now, eh, the container loss incidents, the environmental impact. I think it's a matter of time because uh, when these kind of regulations are kicking in and. And uh, we are uh, looking for uh, for solutions, right? There is there, there is clearly a kind of a problem: uh, increasing vessel sizes, increasing amount of container loss incidents. So I think it's a matter of time before uh, some regulations are are sharpened around this topic. Yeah, there are already regulations in place, uh, but for sure they will be uh, relooked. Uh, also taking into account the new climate averages. Uh, the, the, uh, what I just explained: uh, the more harsh weather, more erratic weather uh, on the Atlantic, which have impacts. Sorry, I'll leave it off mute. Our next question is from uh, George. Uh, he asked, what has been left off is the container itself. Today's CSC box was designed to criteria established in 1976 with higher loads and bigger ships. Are those standards adequate today? And, and I, wanna, I wanna add a little bit to that question because it's going to be hard to change the standards of the ship. But it seems to me if you know that there are storms approaching or this particular route as you collect data has a not you know a higher chance of the parametric role or such there's an opportunity in the port you know maybe maybe we can't weigh all the containers but if we know this is a high risk voyage ahead based on your software analysis can we then weigh that containers in this particular port where there's a higher or provide more lashings is there more that can be done in that prepare pre Territory phase if this information is shared with the port authorities. Yeah, I think sharing information is kind of a common theme in shipping, right? Having uh, share information, uh, be aware of, of what's happening, uh, connecting items together. So uh, I think I think it's a common theme that uh, if you have the intel on uh, what's happening uh, outside the harbor in, in a day or two. Uh, you can you can adjust your procedures on that. So yes, knowing uh, what's happening uh, and, and connecting uh, the information cycles uh, that within shipping, I would say is a common theme uh, to have that kind of shared reality, uh, not only between uh, vessel and, 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 and office, but also between port. And uh, if, if data becomes more connected, uh, our lives uh, will be easier because then uh, we can see the trends and, uh, and, and, and building procedures for that. Yeah, maybe also uh, to, to comment on that one, uh, one, one example is that uh, the newer generation of, of port cranes, of course, they have, are equipped with, with proper measurement of weighing every container which is in the crane. 
Um, and this is, of course, I think a very uh, important connection where I do think that technology will solve it in, in the coming years if every port, crane port, is equipped with proper measurement and there is a, a good data sharing that it can be verified. I think that that is one of the key things to, to make sure that it's, it's uh, covered of what is from shore put on the vessel that's really verified. Um, I hope this, this will uh, proceed really quickly. Excellent. Um, we have another question from Chris O'Donnell. I'll pick out Chris because he's giving the real hard ball, uh, ball questions here. Uh, and we, we don't want to avoid those. We want to, we want to get into the hard ball. So he says, what are the averages when comparing lost containers to total move? It's got to be somewhere in the fractions of the point, but just curious. So, I mean, how many millions of TUs do we lose? Do we move successfully every year and we only lose a, a few thousand containers? It's, is this a needle in a haystack or is it worth doing if it's a, such a small percentage of the successful containers moved? Well, I, I, I think that's, uh, that, well, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a good question, but uh, I do think that uh, the target should be that the, the loss in, in any industry should, should be zero. Uh, and of course, the, the, the shipping industry is a global industry. So if a container gets lost on, on, the, on the middle of the Pacific, um, it has uh, for, for the media uh, and, and the people maybe a less impact than if it was uh, washes on shore. So uh, I think every container is one too much. Every part, part of cargo is, one, uh, is, is too much. Um, so yes, uh, that's why we aim for uh, the zero container loss. Yeah, yeah I agree with you, Jan. Uh, we should... Uh... It might be a small number, but every container is too much, especially if you have some chemicals in it, uh, polluting the, uh, the environment. Uh, I think if we can restrict that, because the tools are at hand, right, in order to, uh, to, uh, to get to a lower number. So uh, uh, I think if we can, uh, can help that and, and give that, uh, that insights, uh, yeah, that, that's beneficial, I think, to, to all of us. Yeah. Yeah, maybe one example uh, is the area where I go sailing myself uh, or, uh, along the North Sea coast is, is where uh, with the container loss, uh, th there are still uh, very small plastic bowls which are washed on shore and it's very hard to, uh, to, uh, to, to get it cleaned. Uh, so it's, it's a long-term effect. Uh, so it's, it's of course a combination of what, what kind of cargo is lost in which area but of course, I think the statement should be uh, every, every cargo uh, losses one too much. John, you're uh, <laughs> you're muted. Okay, I'm just going to leave it off mute because I keep doing that. Excellent answers, but we also have to remember the you know the the size of these super ships that are growing. It, it's it's. I don't know, I wouldn't say lucky because it's the same number of seafarers on a small ship as these large ships. So we're putting people at risk and the environment at risk and it's unacceptable to have. Again, they said their hope is zero incidents, right? But we have these bigger, uh, again, the fat tail and we have these bigger uh, container ships. And they think that the, you know, their estimates, Alliance had an estimate that if a mega, container ship uh, went down, it could be billions of dollars in uh, losses. So uh, I think this is probably the uh, last question. I, I want to ask another because again, our participant rate, you, no one's dropping off. They're, they're glued to the screen here. It's been rising the whole session. Um, David Townsend asked this excellent question. Uh, ship size has been scaled up dramatically, but as we have said in a question, the containers have not been scaled up. But what has also not been scaled up is the lashing. Some lashings are used on all size ships. Uh, this is logical. And I say, I think lashings is not your solution. That's clear. But I think what is your solution is as the containers sizes grow bigger, what more do we need uh, in terms of technology? The sizes of the ships have been increasing. Has the technology been increasing to match the size of these vessels? 
Yes. Um, I think that the, the size has, of course, ha, ha, has increased enormously. Um, and uh, I also saw it with, with the speed and the size and, and taking the risk during navigation. Um, uh, I do think uh, it is safe, of course, what I think also previous question, what, what is a share of lost containers? Um, but with uh, proper uh, navigation and measurements, I think we, we can make, can make and will make also in the coming 10 years, a, a great step. If we already combine or check how vessels are operated nowadays, uh, compared with 10 years ago or 20 years ago, we go from, from faxing communication to uh, now open internet. Um, and we see also that uh, it becomes more and more implemented, uh, but it's also really, uh, let's say, uh, a combined journey. Um, how to operate with this uh, open connectivity, but also how, how to uh, work out when the con uh, connection uh, to shore is lost. So it, it is something which is evolving. So uh, one thing also for the, for the big vessels, but also smaller vessels, uh, we see more and more um, operational centers from uh, ship operators when, when there is 24 seven support. Uh, 10 years ago, that was not there. And here now they can, can live follow up and experts can back up the captain or also challenge uh, captain's decision. And in the end, I think a, a discussion between experts uh, gives a better result uh, supported by technology. Hey, one thing I do want to add to that, Japan, is that often it's a chain of events, right? So it's it's a combination, right? Of the lashing, of the weather, uh, and it's it's the weakest link, right? Where where it where it kind of breaks down. Uh, meaning, but hey, if you have the tools at hand to uh, to, to to do some more some better lashing, but also some technology, hey, it, it strengthens, and you you kind of make that chain more robust in order to to keep it to the to the seakeeping uh, terminology. Yeah. I think to conclude from my side, uh, I think the biggest risk is that uh, if you operate uh, with something which is broken, which you don't realize, same you go out for a drive with your car and your brakes are not working uh, properly and you don't know, and you will break too late. And this is the thing which, uh, which needs to be solved and a lot of parties need to, uh, need to work on that. Well, getting in my car, I have the little device I can plug in and it tells me if there's an engine order and it sends it to my insurance company and I get a discount. Are you guys working with insurance companies on, you know, with these billion dollar potential claims? You want to answer? I'll, I'll leave the last uh, question to you, uh, uh, Yarko, if, and if you want to add anything to that. Um, well, so we are not working directly with insurance company, but it does, and like mentioned, technology is advancing and it is the extra touch that uh, that can make a difference, like mentioned, in the whole chain of events. And this particular technology solutions can help uh, identifying and avoiding that uh, that losses. So, uh, yeah, and I, I think we can connect it to the uh, regulations questions, right? I think I think we're uh, we're about to. Uh, had to see some some type of res, re, regulations around these kind of topics and uh, uh, and let's see if technology can can play a role in that as well great I, I think this this is the question you got to install the software on board but also ask your insurance company ask your regulators your flag state your port state if I install this you know can you, what what other efficiencies can we unlock because it's part of a package system I really thank you, Yap Jan and Yarko with ABB DTN. And I apologize. Uh, I mean, again, our participant rate is in the hundreds and we had 57 questions that are unanswered. I can't possibly answer them all in this uh, episode. And we have dozens more across G Captain's social media, Facebook, Twitter, and so forth. So we apologize for not, uh, this is unexpected response, but, uh, Yarko, can you talk about if people still have a question after this, how, how they can get those answered and what will be provided to them if they register? Yeah, exactly. So uh, some, some follow-up uh, emails will follow and, and you can see it here on the screen, right? So there are, uh, there is, uh, of course, if you have other questions, uh, you can fill them in at the, uh, at the below website in order to, uh, 
to get them answered. So if you have any burning questions, uh, fill them in at dtn.com slash weather slash shipping, and uh, we will take care that your question gets, uh, gets answered. Excellent. Yeah, Pian, any final comments before we leave? Um, no, I wish everybody a great day. Great day, and thank you, everyone. And remember, it is the week of the seafarers, so please thank your crew and thank the seafarers out there. And, and let's work on getting uh, you know, safer ships and reducing some of these environmental problems. I am Captain John Conrad, founder of gcaptain.com. You can find us on Facebook and Twitter and at gcaptain.com. And we have uh, Yarko with DTN. You can find him at dtn.com. And uh, Yap Yan with ABB. There will be follow-up after this, and we encourage you guys to uh, reach out to these guys and find out more. Thank you so much. Thank you.